All right, so tonight we are going to talk about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, of the Messiah. So um, we did this last year, actually. We did it a year ago. I did something on this, but we probably all forgot because I know you can't remember what you did yesterday. So it's not really, who cares? Oh, yeah, I remember what you did a year ago. But I think we did do a topic, uh, something like this, about a year ago or a little more, maybe you know, around the same time of the year. So, But I've changed it up a little bit. Um, so let me go ahead and pull up my uh, slide set here, as I like to do, and that will help us tremendously. And go from here. Okay. All right. So I'm going to do do the, like I did last week with Dr. Brown. I'm going to be giving you like the full slide picture. Hey, there's Noah. Hi, Noah. Um, I see you in the corner there. <laughs> Hi, buddy. So. We're going to talk a little bit tonight. I'm going to be using these words, um, uh, data and inference a lot, um, because I think that's helpful when we're talking about the resurrection. Now, I don't know how many of you have had the chance to talk about the resurrection with other people. And by the way, if you have questions while I'm talking, write them in the chat room. I'll try to see them as I'm going along here. But we, do, we will take discussion question, question time more towards uh, the end as I'm done. But uh, I don't know how many of you had the chance to even talk about the resurrection with other people, whether you've used it in articulating what you believe, you know, about God's existence or your own beliefs. I'm not sure. Um, or maybe you just haven't had to talk about it at all. I, I don't know. But the point is that hopefully you are and hopefully you, you're going to have more opportunities. But I hope that you at least know after tonight a little bit more about how to discuss this topic, because it is so important. Uh, and uh, it's not just important for our personal uh, discussions, like personal outreach, but it's also important for us as a community. It's important for the larger culture as a whole to see that we, you know, we have reasons why we actually think Jesus rose from the dead. Um, you know, so there's a lot that goes into this. So don't take it lightly. So one thing we do want to remember, of course, is that you know, no matter how someone, no matter if someone's busy, you know, like it's, you're around people that are busy all the time and they sometimes say, well, I'll look into this when I'm older or I just don't have time. You know, I got a lot going on, got goals in my life, got to get a job, marriage, all that stuff, whatever it is. We need to remind people that the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus, you know, of the Messiah really isn't going to change by how busy you are. It's not impacted by whether you see the need for God. It's not impacted whether you're happy or not, uh, by whether you're happy or not. It's certainly not impacted whether you believe it or don't believe it. Um, you know, just because you don't believe Jesus rose from the dead doesn't mean he didn't rise from the dead. Um, so whether you blow it off or stay busy, uh, it's irrelevant. It's an historical claim we're making. And history isn't changed by your feelings. History isn't changed by whether you see the need for God and history isn't changed by your emotions, okay? And so we need to remind people that they're making an objective truth claim, okay? That Jesus died and rose from the dead. That's what we do with history. Just like if I say, if Inger Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, hopefully most of you are not gonna consider, well, you know what? I don't, I'm not happy about that. So maybe he didn't get assassinated. That sounds cruel. Well, you know, whether you like it or not, it's kind of irrelevant to whether Abraham Lincoln was assassinated or not. We have to look at the facts of history, okay? It's an historical claim we're making. So just a little reminder there as we go forward. Also, just a little quick reminder about faith, a word that is greatly misunderstood today, and of course, a word that sometimes we don't do a great job of articulating. Now, biblically, faith means trust or fidelity, uh, commitment to God, but we don't need to understand that you know, we our faith doesn't make God exist. Our faith doesn't make Jesus rise from the dead, right? Um, it's not like magic. If you just believe hard enough, you can make something happen. All your faith does is responds to the knowledge God, God has given to us, okay? And so when I heard the good news, the gospel in my 20s, I was hearing a claim that Jesus was a real person. He died and rose from the dead. He died for my sins, rose from the dead to give me new life. And I responded to that knowledge. Okay, that's knowledge God has given the world of what he's done through the person of Jesus. God has given knowledge of himself. Okay. And so when God decides to communicate something, since we all rely on communication to know anything, you wouldn't know anything about anybody on in your life. 
you wouldn't have any relationships, friendships, anything unless someone decided to communicate, whether it be by email, call, physical touch, whatever it is, um, meeting in person. God chooses to pick a medium to communicate to us, and that, of course, is through nature itself. We're not talking about that tonight. We're not talking about uh, the natural world. We've done that before. We're talking about the resurrection of the Messiah. And so we can either respond to the knowledge God's given to us, or we can ignore it, okay? But we don't make the resurrection happen through our faith, okay? It, it's a historical event, and that's how God has chosen to reveal himself. He's given knowledge of himself to humans, okay? Okay. So when someone says to you, I can't know if there's a God, I don't know if there's a God, I, I don't know how we can know, they're saying they don't know how to have knowledge of God. That's what they're saying. They don't know, how, how do I get knowledge of God? How do I know he's there? That's what it means to know, right? Knowledge. And we're saying you can know there is a God. You could have knowledge of God if you look at the claims about Jesus and his resurrection, okay? God has revealed himself to the person of Jesus of Nazareth, okay? Okay. So just basic things there, just want to remind us of those things, okay? Because many people will say, you know, I don't know if God exists. If you ever talk to agnostics, they kind of stay and they just can't know land. So you just have, need to say to them, well, how should God show us he's real? What should God do to give us knowledge of himself? And this is one of the ways that he does this, of course, is through history. Now, just a few theological reminders uh, about our own discipleship, uh, the importance of the resurrection. If Jesus had not been raised from the dead, then uh, we're certainly not indwelt by the Ruach or the Holy Spirit right now. None of us are have new life. Um, we're not walking around. We talk about the Spirit's work in your life, the Spirit this and the Spirit that. That isn't going to happen or isn't happening if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. It definitely means you're not, you know, you don't have any kind of new birth in you. You're not regenerated um, because when Jesus left, he said he promised he'd send the Spirit after he rose from the dead. And he can't send the spirit unless he rises from the dead and ascends to the Father, as we read about in Ephesians 4, when it talks about he sent good, the gifts of the spirit, uh, the, the gifts there list in Ephesians 4. Uh, Jesus right now is a role, he, he's fulfilling the role as a priest, right? He stand, he's at the right hand of God. He makes intercession for us. He cleanses us from all sin as we confess our sins. So he's actually at work right now in your life. That can't happen unless he rises from the dead. And if you're struggling with sin in your life, like most of us are, we're in our sanctification process, you cannot attain any victory over any sin without the risen Messiah. If he didn't rise from the dead, he didn't break the power of sin, and we have no chance of overcoming any present struggle without the resurrection, okay? Not just the death, but the resurrection of Jesus, right? So we just need to remember those things, just a reminder. And, of course, finally, as we uh, tell people about the most famous verse in the Bible, John 17, 3, not John 3, 16, John 17, 3, that's the most famous verse, where Jesus says, this is eternal life that they may know you, the one true God and Jesus whom you've sent. Eternal life is a quality of life that starts now. When we came to in a relationship with the Messiah, that's when our eternal life started. It's a quality of life, and it's a quantity of life that carries on through when we die. That's not possible if Jesus didn't rise from the dead because we share in his eternal life, right? He, we share in his life. It's his life he's given to us through what he's done through the resurrection. We don't have our own little eternal lives. We're linked to his eternal life because, I mean, his eternal, he, he is life, of course, okay? Just some reminders there. Now, um, sorry, it's a little blurry, but just uh, I think you can see it. When you think about this tonight as we're going through um, some of the evidence and things for the resurrection, just ask yourself a few questions. I'm not sure on a certainty scale how, how certain people are here that Jesus rose from the dead. Maybe you've never thought about it. and Maybe you've never looked at the historical issues with Jesus because we're talking about history tonight. Maybe you're very certain he rose from the dead. Maybe you're quite certain. Maybe you're somewhat certain. Maybe you're uncertain. Maybe you're doubtful. I don't know. But, you know, sometimes we... Um, you know, sometimes we take a little inventory and say, where am I at? You know, maybe I haven't thought about it. I, I don't know. Um, you'll have to just think about that as you go along here and uh, as we get deeper into this. Now, it's okay if, if you're going through this and you're not sure, you say, well, I'm kind of uncertain or I'm, I don't know, maybe I'm somewhat certain I'm in the middle. That's okay. It's not like we're quizzing you. Um, you'll have to decide that on your own. Now, many people will say, of course, they have supernatural certainty. You know, of course, we have, as I said, we have the gift of the Holy Spirit in us. He gives us a certainty that we're children of God. And when we're walking in the Lord, walking by faith, really uh, empowered by the Spirit, 
we have confidence. We have assurance that we're children of God, right? We, I hope none of us are walking around worried about us losing our salvation 24 hours a day, or whether God's going to boot us out of his family, and we're just living in constant worry and anxiety. If you are, then contact me. I'd like to help you with that. Um, but we need to also remember, though, even if we claim to have supernatural certainty, that's not going to cut it. It's not going to be enough to communicate our faith in today's world. Okay, you can't just that that you can't just use that as the only tool in your tool belt when you're talking to people about our worldview. It just doesn't work that way anymore. It hasn't for a while. Mormons who try to convert me on campus quite regularly tell me they read the Book of Mormon and they have the Holy Spirit who confirms their faith by this burning in their bosom they feel, and that's the conf confirmation that the Book of Mormon is true. Um, they tell me if I read the Book of Mormon, the Holy Spirit will bear witness with the Book of Mormon that it's true. And, you know, that sounds a little bit like what we say sometimes to people about the Bible. And so there's nothing wrong with talking about the Holy Spirit. The point is that you've got to have some other things in your tool belt, okay? You can't just rely only on religious experience because a lot of people haven't had that experience. And other people are having other experiences, uh, religious experiences, okay? I run into them all the time, and you may have some some as well, okay? So just remember that as we go forward here, okay? Now, um, just one thing about the New Testament, uh, or the documents as we, you know, we talk about it. So you remember, when you're talking about the resurrection, you don't necessarily have to appeal to like the entire inerrancy of the Bible. You don't have to use that argument. Um, that's, a, that's a different topic for a different time. You can just start with the New Testament, treating it like ancient documents in antiquity. You can of course, there was no New Testament when Jesus was here and Paul was here. They were not like they're walking around reading the New Testament. It didn't exist. But the point is that you can treat it as a set of historical documents. Okay, that's fine. Yes, it's God's word. I understand that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying you don't uh, have to get burdened by answering every question about inspiration and all that stuff when you're explaining uh, the reliability of the New Testament to people. Okay. All right. So, and once again, if you ever studying the resurrection, you know what the earliest documents we have for the resurrection, they're Paul's letters. Um, as I said before, we don't necessarily need to start with the Gospels. We need to start with Paul. He is the earliest records we have to even talk about the resurrection, okay? Um, yes, they're letters. They're not biographies, but still there's information in there that talks about Jesus rising from the dead. Paul is the earliest records we have. I'll talk about them more as we go along. So that, this is one of the earliest records we have. Um, this is our claim that uh, Jesus, of course, uh, Paul's talking here in 1 Corinthians 15, that he received this information from somebody else. He received a creedal formula here. The, he says, I'm passing it on to you, that Jesus, the Messiah, died for our sins according to scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So when it says he received it there, that means he received it from somebody else. This, this, this formula, the early proclamation of Jesus dying and rising from the dead, um, was already being transmitted in the apostolic community. He probably received it from Peter when he went to visit Peter in Galatia. If you read Galatians 1, he's going to visit Peter. Um, we don't know for sure exactly who he got it from, but the point is that it's most likely Peter, since he mentions him in the creed in 1 Corinthians 15, he calls him uh, Cephas, Cephas, uh, Cephas there. So the point is that uh, this is the earliest record we have, one of the earliest records we have for the resurrection. Um, it's written about 55 AD, but Paul received this information even before that. So he most likely got it somewhere even earlier before he wrote it in 55 AD. And so the resurrection is being proclaimed very early. All right. Now, one thing we need to talk about tonight, as I said, is data and inference, and then um, what the claims are making. Okay. So when someone comes to you and says, you know, you can't prove Jesus rose from the dead and there's just no evidence for it and I wasn't there to see it and they have their little skeptical jargon, um, all history, no matter what it is, but if it's in the past antiquity, of course it's in the past and we can't go back and observe it. We weren't there. Um, anybody knows that we, we weren't there to participate in the events in the Bible. We didn't see any of it happen. Um, we can't observe it. And so that's true. We don't have direct access to that, but that's fine because that's the way all history is practically in the past. That's the way science is as well. A lot of scientific studies. 
So we rely on data, you know, we rely on records, reports, artifacts. Um, but the point is that we, we have a, um, this issue with, uh, we have to rely on a, a method that we need to talk to people about. We're talking about the resurrection because we don't have direct access to the past. And that's okay. You can tell them that, look, I wasn't there to see, I agree, but you weren't there to see anything in the past. You weren't there to see how life began. You weren't see the, the beginning of the universe, how that started. You weren't there at the initial conditions of the earth, but we make, we do science off it. So don't let them get you on the history thing like that's just a done deal, okay? Because that's the way all events are in the past. Now, one thing we do in life is I want to talk about inference tonight. Now, you may say, well, that's a word I don't use much, but you, you infer things all day long in your lives. You all do it. I do it. Um, for example, if, if I'm driving down the street on my way home tonight and I see a... Uh, Actually, it just happened. Actually, half an hour ago, I saw an accident on the side of the road. Car is in pretty bad shape. Uh, there was two people outside the passengers. You know, they're standing outside in the road. I didn't see that accident happen. I didn't. I wasn't there to witness it. I didn't see it directly. But my inference is there was an accident. Obviously, my claim is that there was an auto accident occurred here at this place. Um, that's the most probable explanation to explain what's happening there. Um, or maybe I see an ambulance. And people are being taken away, you know, in the ambulance. I can infer that that person got hurt in an accident, right? So um, there's all kinds of inferences you make all day. I'll give you a, an example of one and another one in a minute. Let me uh, go forward here. I'll show you another one. So let's, um, this is an example of sometimes we make bad inferences. This is just a silly one, but just for example. So let's say um, your daughter comes to you and her boyfriend name is Tim. And let's say, uh, you know, she says to you, your daughter says to you, well, Tim doesn't love me anymore. That She runs in your room at night and gets on your bed and says, oh my gosh, Tim doesn't love me anymore. He didn't call me tonight. And then she's crying and all upset. Well, her inference is that Tim doesn't love me anymore because she didn't, he didn't call her. So she's making an inference. Now that can be a bad inference. She doesn't really know why Tim didn't call her. Maybe he had an issue. Maybe he got delayed at work. Maybe he just hasn't had time. There's a there's other explanations, right? So she's kind of making a quick inference and maybe a perhaps a incorrect inference. We do that sometimes. We infer incorrectly. Happens all the time, right? We say, well, I thought, I inferred, I inferred that, but turns out we inferred incorrectly. So we do make mistakes sometimes our inference inferences. But some of them are right, a lot of them are right. Just depends on what it is. Okay. But the point is you guys infer things all the time. Now, the reason I say this is because. As I said with the resurrection and history, we weren't there to witness any of it or see it. But, you know, if we think about a cold case investigation where the detective comes in and he finds the body laying there on the ground, he was not there to witness that murder. He didn't see what happened. Now he's got to pull out a pad. He's got to come up with some explanations of what can account for that body, right? He wasn't a direct eyewitness. And then what he's going to do is he's going to gather all that data together. He might interview some people. He might, you know, do some more homework. And then he gathers the data and then he presents it in a court of law. And it's called circumstantial evidence, right? Because it's not direct evidence. He didn't see it. And he presents it to the jury. And the goal is to arrive at beyond a reasonable doubt. That's how the people get tried in courtroom settings, right? It happens all the time. I'll give you an example. O.J. Simpson trial. Nobody saw directly what happened to those two victims, right? His wife and Ron Goldman. No one, there was no witnesses. And they had to put together the best uh, explanation they could. They put together data. You know, we saw all the trial scene and everything, but they could not convince that jury beyond a reasonable doubt that OJ was guilty. They couldn't do it. Um, even though they, you know, presented a circumstantial case for what happened to, to, to those two people that got murdered, okay? So we don't have any direct evidence in the OJ case because we weren't there to see it. They had the glove, that's some data, they had some witnesses, they had some other things, but that's the way a lot of times it works with homicide uh, detectives, cold case detectives. They have to go in later when they didn't see what happened, right? And so now, definitely if the cold case detective finds a, a knife in the back of the person, that's a different, you know, that's a whole set of worm, a can of worms that can be open now. Maybe there's some some explanations he can cross off on his pad. Obviously, the person didn't die from a natural death. It probably was an accidental death. It looks like it was intentional, most likely. And he's got to come up 
with a uh, an explanation for what happened. And he's gonna, an explanation of course, is try to show how something happened. You know, what's the cause? You know, how, how did this happen to this person that's laying there? What's the best explanation? Was it a suicide? Did somehow the person turn around, jab himself in the back? That'd be kind of tough. Was it a homicide? Okay, but that's the way a lot of court, uh, cold case investigations work. The point is we, he was not there to see what happened. And so what he does is he, he has to make an inference. The cold case detective has to do the same thing, okay? He wasn't there to see it firsthand. Sometimes we see things firsthand, but what he has to do is he has to make a conclusion based on circumstantial evidence, okay? And that's what he's doing right there. We do it in history, we do it in cold case investigations, we do it in science. And the goal is to find the best explanation. But remember that when, when by the way, my, my friend James Warner Wallace wrote a book, and this is where he started talking about a lot of this process of inferring things, because he, he is a cold case detective by training. And um, you know he talked about learning how to infer things. Remember when we infer things though, we try to come up with the best explanation. The goal is not always absolute certainty, okay? Um, so when someone says, well, you can't prove the resurrection. You can't prove it happened. You weren't there and there's no evidence and you can't prove it. And I always just start talking to them about what do you mean by prove? And they seem to think that you've got to give them absolute certainty um, or it didn't happen. And they just don't know a whole lot about what inference the best explanation is because they're just not trained in it. We don't teach it. You, we use it in, in our, life, our daily lives, but we just don't know when it's there. Okay, and so when it comes to resurrection, all we have to do is come up with an inference to the best explanation. That's what we're trying to do. Come up with the best inference to the best explanation. So what I mean by that is we have the data here. The data is the written records and the witnesses that talk about how Jesus appeared to them. There's, I'll, I'll, I'll break this down as we go on. But Jesus appeared to many individuals and groups after he died. Uh, Paul, of course, came to faith. He wrote the majority of the New Testament. You have the empty tomb there. You have James coming to faith, number four. Then you have the Jesus movement starting, uh, a new religious movement starting the first century. Um, you know, sometimes historians will ask, well, how did this new movement get started? You know, what were the factors that got this thing going? I mean, Jesus died. You know, would the movement died after that? If Jesus died, would it just died out if he'd ever been resurrected? Yes, it actually would have probably died out. You know, why did the early followers of Jesus suddenly worship him? That's kind of a no-no in Second Temple Judaism. We don't really, um, you know, we don't see a lot of Jewish people worshiping a man. That's kind of, that's an idolatry issue in their own faith. So something changed. Something happened to them that caused them to start to want to pray to Jesus, teach, you know, reach, look at him like he is the same thing as the God of Israel, the same God they worshiped all their lives. So we have the day in the written records, and all we have to do is come up with the best inference. What's the best explanation for these six things? Okay, what, what explains this the best? Is it the resurrection of Jesus or is it something else? Now, another simple way, um, another way, if you could look at the data here, I have kind of a, a, a smaller portion of it if you want to kind of do it. Oops, sorry, I went too fast there. You have like the data you could just talk about at the top here. Um, when I talk here about the data at the top, just that you know, the disciples had experiences. They believed that Jesus was appearing to them. Paul had that experience. Of course, Jesus died. That's part of the data. And then the inference part is in the middle. And then we go to our claim. Our claim is that we think Jesus physically rose from the dead. That's what explains the data. Okay. So when someone says to you, you know, you can't prove Jesus rose from the dead, we should be asking them, what is the best explanation for these issues? But here's the key. You've got to, if they're not, if they're interested, I'm talking about somebody who's really interested. Like if someone doesn't care, you're wasting your time, right? If someone's just hardened and indifferent, I mean, you can't do anything about that. But I'm talking about someone that's a truth seeker, someone that cares. And you run into those sometimes. They're not everywhere, but they're there. Um, we sometimes have to go over the data with them. Okay, we have to spend time talking about this data that we have before they're gonna, you know, agree with us about the claim we're making, okay? And so with that's, that's the part we have to spend some time on, okay? So that's our claim. We have the data, we have the inference, and we believe the claim is we're saying that Jesus physically rose from the dead. He wasn't a spirit. He wasn't a ghost. He was a physical Jesus, the same Jesus that came out of the, same Jesus was crucified, came out of the tomb. Of course, he looked different. 
you know, he, he was a little more healed at that point. Of course, they could see his wounds, but the point is it's the same Jesus, okay? Now, there's other inferences people are going to make, and those are called natural inferences, meaning that they might try to go off this chart and find a better explanation for what happened to, to explain all that data I just talked about. They may go through one of these down the list there. I'm not going to go through every one of these tonight. I've done that elsewhere. I'll send you a clip. Um, when I sent out the clip from this, there I went over 16 objections of the resurrection, but um, they might try to pull out one of these. They may say, well, you know, uh, the best explanation, it was made up, or the best explanation is the disciples took uh, uh, you know, some sort of drug in the first century to cause them to hallucinate, um, or the disciples um, you know, went to the wrong tomb, or the disciples lied about it, um, or this, or that. You know, you could go over all these possibilities, but the question is, what is the best explanation that explains all the data, okay? It has to be able to explain all the data adequately. Now, someone could say, well, it's possible that Jesus was an alien. Like, see the far right here? Jesus was an alien. Yeah, you can throw out all the possibilities you want. The question is, what's the evidence for it? Okay, I can assert that Jesus was an alien. All that is is an assertion. I want evidence Jesus was an alien. Can you give me any kind of evidence that Jesus was an alien? You know, I mean, there's all, you can throw anything you want out there. The question is, what's the evidence for it? And just because you throw it out, there's a possibility. Doesn't mean it's reasonable. Everything that's possible is not reasonable. Okay. So don't let someone throw you off like that. Well, it's possible this happened. Yeah. But is it reasonable? And is, is it have, does it answer all the data? Most of the time it doesn't. These things fall short. Okay. So we'll talk about it a little more. All right. So let's talk a little bit about some of the data. Um, when we're talking about Jesus's death uh, and burial, you know, when I'm talking to someone, do you actually, you know, do you actually consider Jesus to be a real person? I'd say about 95% of people I run into believe, it's funny in campus, I'm noticing now, or I've noticed for a while, they say to you, well, I, they, I don't have to bring it up to say, well, I believe Jesus was a real person. Like they pointed out to me, they actually believe he was a real person. Like, I'm like, well, that's good. I'm like, because you're within about 98% of most of New Testament scholarship out there. So I'm glad that you agree, agree that Jesus was a real person. Um, so I don't know. They seem to be pointing that out more to me. Maybe they think I'm worried that they don't believe he was like a real person. But anyway, so let's talk a little bit about the data that, about Jesus' death and burial. We know that the death of Jesus is presupposed in about every writing of the New Testament in the early community. And let me show you, um, when it comes to Jesus' death, you know, of course, we have, as far as written records, you know, you have the four Gospels that mention his death. You have all Paul's, you have Paul's writings, you have Acts, you have Paul's letters, which are the earliest uh, writings, which mention his death. Um, you know, you keep going. The rest of the New Testament writings mentioned his death. Uh, you know, Peter, John, 1 John, you've got Jude, Revelation. Hebrews, of course, talks a lot about the death of Jesus as a priest. Um, and then you've got some extra biblical sources. Um, probably the two best ones to use, as, as Mike Lacona pointed out, are Josephus and Tacitus. Um, the other ones are so-so, um, probably not as strong as those two. But uh, you've got, you know, you've even got Gnostic Gospels. Those are the Gospels that are dated outside of the first century. I mean, we don't read those because they're dated too late, and they've got all kinds of weird embellishments in them. But, I mean, you can read them online. They're not, like, forbidden. We're not, like, keeping them from everybody. Like, it's a conspiracy, like they used to say when the Da Vinci Code came out. Like, oh, there's all these, there's all these writings about Jesus out there. You guys are suppressing them. The church is suppressing the truth. I was like, no, actually, you've been able to read those for years. You can go right online. They're all online. But anyway, um, yeah, these are uh, dated later, but some have mentioned about Jesus dying. So it's interesting, you know, that that he's mentioned in these writings, you know, all through the second century, too, even if they're not as uh, strong as the first century documents, which they're not. Um, you also have some archaeological evidence that ties in with a couple of people that were in charge of Jesus's crucifixion. Um, one was Pilate. Uh, we have the Pilate inscription here that was found a long time, uh, a ways back, and I think it was the 60s or so. Um, this slate, this uh, uh, stone slate here that mentioned his name, um, the dates, to, uh, you know, that has been viewed as archaeologists as being actually written about the Pilate, the one that ordered Jesus' crucifixion, you know, the Pilate in the Gospels. Um, so that's something that came out and kind of boosted our archaeological evidence uh, for the crucifixion, because obviously Pilate played a big role in ordering the crucifixion. 
Um, so, and also you have the uh, the bone box of Caiaphas. If you guys remember the uh, the uh, the trial scene in Mark 16, where um, Jesus stands before the Sanhedrin and he is viewed as uh, committing a blasphemous claim. Caiaphas is the high priest, right? He had a Jewish trial and a Roman trial, right? It was during that Jewish trial that Caiaphas was there, and they found a bone box, um, which they think is the actual Caiaphas. The ossuary has the bones in there, by the way. It's what it is. They found these in Israel, a ton of these, and a dig they did. They found they found just tons of them. So your bones will be placed in ossuary your family. That's the way they did burials. At. And so they found an ossuary that had Caiaphas on it, the same Caiaphas they believe is the, uh, the one that uh, is mentioned in that trial scene. Okay, so... A couple of archaeological discoveries are interesting, you know, that boosts our, our view of the two people involved in Jesus's crucifixion, kind of interesting. Um, even um, a guy like Crossan, uh, J.D., uh, John Dominic Crossan, who is not at all an Orthodox Christian, um, you know, just kind of a, we might call liberal Christian. I mean, he believes Jesus is a real person, doesn't believe in the resurrection because of his worldview, but he definitely believes that Jesus's death is something that's certain. He says, you know, Tacitus and Josephus wrote about it. Um, you know, it's interesting that he definitely says Jesus was definitely crucified. Doesn't believe his resurrection necessarily because of his worldview. But he says, you know, that Josephus wrote about it. Now we had some of Josephus's stuff is not reliable. We reliable, we know that, but there are some things in Josephus that has been shown to be reliable about Pilate condemning him. Um, and there's some passages in Josephus that mentioned James, his brother. Um, and one of the most reliable versions of Josephus is from the, um, this version right here, the, uh, if you read about the Arab, Arabic version of Josephus. So that part has been shown to be fairly reliable, but some of the other stuff, there's some embellishment in it. Um, but you just have, depends on what you're reading. But the, they've come up the conclusion that this is one thing that Josephus wrote about that is reliable. And then the uh, Tacitus passage uh, speaks about the rise of the early Christians here about there's a, you know, a group that rises up and uh, obviously it was something that, uh, you know, that Pilate, they mentioned Pilate here. And so they mentioned it as a superstition or just, or uh, Tassus mentioned it was viewed as a superstition. And so, you know, it'd be hard for them to really rise up and do that if there probably wasn't based on some kind of real Jesus who was crucified. So Jesus and Josephus and Tassus are probably two of our best sources outside the New Testament. Some of the other ones are so-so, as uh, Mike Lacona said. You have a guy like Gerd Ludeman, um, who's not a, he's an atheist. He says Jesus was definitely crucified, no doubt about it. Um, you know, says that you don't need to really discuss it any further. Now, I'm not pointing out that, you know, I'm not trying to quote mine here just to get everyone supports our views, but it is interesting, you know, you don't necessarily have to point always just to Christians who believe it. I mean, there are even skeptical scars and atheists who believe at least that Jesus was crucified. Okay, so if we get people to the point they believe the data that Jesus was really crucified on the on the uh, the records alone, the written records and the archaeological data, we've got them off to point one. They agree with that. A couple of things about Jesus's crucifixion. Have you ever asked yourself why Jesus was crucified? I've asked people this. Um, what got Jesus into trouble? No, it wasn't for claiming to be the Messiah. That's not a blasphemous claim in Jewish law. It doesn't require capital offense. So if Jesus claimed to be the Messiah or not, which he um, kind of did in Mark six, Mark 14, kind of said something there. They asked him if he's a Messiah and he said, I am. It's not a criminal offense to say that or capital offense. And they didn't really do anything there with that. It'd make a big deal. Um, what really got Jesus in trouble was his uh, view that he was equal to God. You know, uh, we talked about this in John 10. And then, of course, you know, he talked about he had the authority to forgive sins. You know, anything to claim to be doing, uh, the only things that God can do is considered a blasphemous claim. And that's what he was doing. That's what really started to get him in trouble uh, with the authorities. OK. And so, you know, Jesus also did set some things in the parables. You know, he talked about judgment to come to Israel. He talked about the Jewish leadership would be judged. Um, so, you know, he really was doing a lot that uh, the God of Israel did. You know, he talked about judging. He's the only, he can judge too. He's the authority to judge and forgive sins. And that's what got him in trouble, um, obviously. Now, um, remember about crucifixion? It's uh, obviously, as you probably know, it's the worst form of death. It's used as a deterrent uh, by the Romans. They did it a lot to, to, you know, to hopefully cause people not to commit crimes. That's why when someone's hanging on a crucifixion stake, it's supposed to be a deterrent, right? 
they're not looking up going, oh man, he's awesome. He's he's hanging on that crucifixion stake. That's a real winner in our eyes. No, it's a terrible way to die. It's embarrassing and shameful. And so, you know, we ought to understand that uh, Jesus dying and being crucified was not something that uh, the Jews would look at him and go, oh yeah, he, that's a really great thing. Yeah, we're so excited he's being crucified. No, it was a shameful, embarrassing thing. So in Luke 9, 23, when Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, if you want to follow me, you can only do it if you take up your cross and follow me. They knew that's what that meant. It meant self-denial. It meant embarrassment, shame, rejection, misunderstanding, because that's what the crucifixion stood for. Okay. All right. Let's talk a little bit about the burial. Um, now, it's important to understand Judaism. Uh, in Jewish thought, burial is, is very important. Okay. We see this starting in the Old Testament with Abraham uh, purchasing a cave for Sarah, Jacob's body being taken to Canaan to be buried in a tomb. A lot of times you bury their family again. Uh, the bones of Saul are given and his sons are given proper burial. A lot of emphasis on burial in uh, Jewish thought. You know, it's interesting, a side note, when I was at a, uh, the Jewish community center here where I, near where I live about five or six years ago, I used to live, these, the rabbis had these pamphlets inside the Jewish community center that said, uh, don't get your loved one cremated. Um, they were against cremation. Um, and so they were kind of seeing a, a trend in the Jewish uh, community where people were getting cremated. And they started to point out of the importance of proper burial in Judaism. And they thought that uh, cremate, they were I read the pamphlet, they said cremation is more like a pagan practice. Uh, and so, it's interesting, you know, that because of course Orthodox Jews believe in resurrection. You know, they don't they they hold, they believe the same things we believe in. Our belief in resurrection comes out of Judaism anyway. But the point is that they really, really are getting down on their community for just taking a lax view and getting cremated. Um, and so that's kind of interesting. That's a topic for another time. And there have been some good books um, on the burial. If you want to go deeper on this, get some of Craig Evans' work. Uh, he's done a lot of work on this. If you want to read further on the archaeological evidence and some other issues. But one of the reasons why burial is so important, um, because if you read in Deuteronomy 21, oh, I've got a DNT there, sorry, it says dent, should be Deuteronomy, sorry, D-E-U-T, it's my fault, forgive me, I've sinned. But in Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 to 23, it talks about if you have someone hanging on a tree, his corpse can't remain all night, it can't be exposed, right? You've got to take the corpse down, you've got to have it buried, because if you don't, the land is defiled, the land is uh, not clean, okay? A dead body out there exposed in the middle of the day laying there is going to defile the whole land. And, you know, if you read about this a little bit in Ezekiel, it says here they will set apart men to pass their land regularly and bury any invaders who remain on the, the face of land so as to cleanse it, they shall cleanse the land. So, you know, God, there's a big, big emphasis on, um, you know, not having any kind of dead bodies just laying around. And so when Jesus is hanging up there on the crucifixion stake, you better believe it that there's someone there saying, I don't want him laying up there all day. I want him getting a proper burial, right? Because if he's hanging up there in the middle of that, um, you know, in the middle of the day, that means that, well, first of all, they would think God had cursed that person because he's defiling the land, right? Just hanging there all day. Not getting favor from God if you're hanging up on a crucifixion stake. No Jewish person's looking at you like you're gaining the favor of God. You must have done something wrong, something seriously wrong. You must have broken the Torah or done something, okay? Even uh, Josephus uh, talked about this. Uh, he alludes to this in Deuteronomy 21 to 23, 22 to 23 in his writing. Josephus said here, he's a Jewish historian at the time of Jesus. He was a Pharisee. He said here, he that blasphemes God, let him be stoned and let him be hang, hang all day and let him be buried in, you know, in an obscure manner. And so this issue of, you know, if you uh, blaspheme God, um, you know, that's a very serious thing. So if you're up there hanging in the, that stake in the middle of the day, Roman crucifixion, say, that means you must have done something to God's name. You did something really wrong, okay? And that's very serious because I just want you to get the picture of Jews walking by and seeing Jesus hanging there. You know, it's not a badge of honor. It's not a symbol of love. You know, today we have crosses around our neck, like Jesus loves me. Um, I understand what you're saying, but that's not the original context, okay? Um, it was a symbol of shame, embarrassment, rejection by God, 
you've done something against God that was serious and you're getting punished. Okay. And furthermore, if you're not taken down and you're, you're going to defile the land too. If you're not taken off that cross and buried properly, you're going to be defiling the land. So enter into the, um, the passages here. Look at uh, Deuteronomy 28. These are the passages for blessing. If you're, if you're doing the right thing it says, if you fully obey the Lord, your God and carefully follow all the commands I give you today, the Lord, your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings will come upon you, company if you obey the Lord. But if you're, if you're not blessing God in number two here, you're obviously getting cursed and you're outside the presence of God and you're unclean. Okay. And so most likely anyone hanging on a Roman crucifixion stake is um, unclean. Okay. They're not getting blessed, not a blessing at all. So normally when it comes to uh, crucifixion, the victims were left to die sometimes in Roman crucifixion. Sometimes they of course, be left there and the birds would come and start pecking their eyes or pecking their heads because the Romans wanted them to be out there as long as they could because it was a deterrent. They wanted people to walk by and say, I don't want to be like that guy. I don't want to break Roman law and have that happen to me, right? So sometimes, mo many times the body was just left out there all day in the middle of the afternoon, you know, in the sunlight, very unpleasant thing. You could rot away and be picked apart by birds and animals, right? But some cases... We see in the, the, uh, some Roman writings, they did permit the bodies to be taken down and buried. Some cases, okay? So obviously the, the goal in Jewish burial was burial would need to take place the day of death. And of course, if death occurred at the end of the day or at night or the following day, okay? And so you uh, generally Jewish burial, number two, the body's washed and wrapped. Um, you know, you see this in the story of Lazarus, right? He was bound and wrapped with clothes and, you know, and Jesus raised him from the dead. John 11, and then, of course, Jesus is wrapped in a clean linen, right? He's prepared by uh, Joseph of Arimathea, which I'll talk about. And so they're very interested in all the, uh, the burial uh, customs. You know, there's a whole procedure there, okay? Very, take it very seriously. And, but the point is that also, um, we get this debate over whether Jesus would be able to be given a proper burial, because a lot of times criminals if you were an executed criminal, like Jesus was viewed as a criminal, some, in some cases, you wouldn't be able to be buried in a place of honor. You know what a place of honor is to be buried? It's in a family tomb, okay, when you have a family tomb. Um, and a lot of people couldn't afford a family tomb, as I'll show in a minute, but that would be an honorable burial. Um, now, in the some of the Jewish writings here, um, in the rabbinic literature, it talks a little bit about this. It says in one writing here, it says, neither a corpse nor the bones of a corpse may be transferred from a wretched place to an honored place, nor needless to say from an honored place to a wretched place, but if the family tomb, but if to the family tomb, even from an honored place or wretched place, it is permitted. And then it says here, number three, it says, not only was the body of a criminal not to be buried in a place of honor, no public mourning for executed criminals was permitted. They used not to make lamentation for mourning his place in the heart alone. So in some writings, it says that the person can't receive a proper burial, an honorable burial. And then it's interesting, some of the Roman writings, it does say they can. Now, the question is, Pilate, here's Pilate during Passover. Remember, Jesus is crucified during Passover. It was one of the biggest Jewish feast festivals there is in their history during that season. You probably have all these Jewish people there, these uh, pilgrims coming for the festival, for the feast. And here's Pilate with a decision he has to make. Does he want to give Jesus a proper burial or does he want to cause a problem with all these uh, extra Jewish people there and, you know, create maybe a little bit of a very contentious situation? The question becomes, what does he do? You know, does he, is, what, he's got to make a decision. And what happens is we know that someone came forward um, well, first of all, we know that uh, from the writings of Josephus that uh, Pilate generally didn't grant exceptions, generally speaking. But then Josephus says, number two, he recalls seeing three of his friends crucified during the siege of Jerusalem and how he begged the Roman general Titus for permission to take them down from the cross, and it was granted. So sometimes there was an exception made. Apparently, Josephus talks about this. Sometimes they'll make an exception to have a person buried properly. But the deal with Jesus is, that uh, we read that Joseph of Marathia comes forward and asks for a proper burial, right? Um, and we know that uh, Pilate, the gospels say Pilate granted that burial. I mean, he did allow jo uh, Joseph of Marathia to do it. Now, 
Remember, Joseph of Marathia was rich, came from a wealthy family, as far as we know. He was part of the Sanhedrin. And this would be the kind of tomb that Joseph of Marathia had as a family tomb. And guess who definitely could afford a tomb like that? That would be Jesus. Jesus came from a poor family, the best of our understanding. Didn't come from an aristocratic, rich family. And Joseph of Marathia comes forward and says, let me give him a proper burial. And we know that Joseph of Marathia buries Jesus in his family tomb. Jesus gets a burial in the family tomb. By the way, at the end of Isaiah 53, it says the Messiah, or the, the suffering servants buried with the rich man into his death, right? Um, talks about the rich man burying buried the rich man. Kind of interesting. So perhaps this is a fulfilled prophecy. So that's what a rock cut tomb would kind of look like. And boy, picture a big stone over that, trying to get that thing moved, right? I'm not so by the way, I'm not saying that's a tomb of Jesus. I'm saying that would be similar to the kind of tomb that he was buried in, okay? All four gospels talk about Josephus. He's the one that gets the opportunity to bury or to give Jesus a proper burial. Um, you know, he's a man of wealth, but he's from the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin were the ones that ordered the crucifixion of Jesus be very strange for the gospel authors to make up a Josephus, um, given that Josephus came from the very Jewish party that ordered Jesus' crucifixion and rejected him. You know, it's interesting that they would even try to make up a guy named Josephus. It's most likely authentic. That is why Jody Magnus, who we had speak at our congregation about eight or nine years ago, she's a Jewish archaeologist, not a believer, doesn't believe in Jesus. I don't even know if she believes in God, but she does archaeological digs all over Israel and tombs and ossuaries. She says here, there's no need to assume the gospel accounts of Joseph of Marathia offering Jesus a place in his family tomb or legendary apologetic. She says the gospel accounts of Jesus' burial appear to be largely consistent with the archaeological evidence. Um, she believes the, the burial story is authentic, even though she doesn't necessarily believe Jesus rose from the dead. Um, but she says the burial story is authentic. So that's kind of interesting for someone that's not even a, a believer at all, just a Jewish archaeologist, secular Jewish archaeologist. Okay, so let's talk a little about the appearances now. <clears throat> the data fact, uh, number another issue about the data, getting people to agree on the data. So I always ask people, if you agree Jesus died, you agree he was buried, do you agree at least Paul and the disciples believed they saw him rise in the dead? They perceived it as a risen Jesus. That was their perception their senses, their five senses that they saw Jesus rise from the dead. If we can get them to at least agree on this, then we can start talking about what explains it. You have all these different appearances, different locations. Um, you know, you have uh, group appearances, individual appearances, where Jesus is physically appearing to certain people individually and corporately. You had the appearance to Paul, of course, that was by himself, but Paul corroborates his appearance. I mean, he talks about his appearance in 1 Corinthians 15. It's similar. He talks about he appeared to me too. Okay. All, most all scholarship agrees that the disciples had experiences of the risen Jesus. They're not really disputing whether the disciples actually thought they saw him. That's not really the dispute. The thing where they disagree on is what explains it. Okay. And so what we get into is you know, what is the best explanation for this? Did the disciples have some sort of visionary encounter? Was it a, some sort of translation thing like where, you know, Enoch and Elijah went right up to heaven and did Jesus appear and just go right up to heaven or something? You know, who knows? I mean, or was it an apparition? Apparitions like a ghost. Um, sometimes people see ghost like figures, you know, they think it's like a ghost. That's an apparition is. Or, you know, was it a physical raised Jesus? For example, some of these guys, they always uh, talk about, you know, Jesus being an apparition. You know, they think maybe the disciples thought they saw Jesus, maybe it was a ghost or something. This is kind of what Marcus Borg said before he died, liberal, you know, New Testament scholar. He said in the early Christian community, these disciples had visions or apparitions of Jesus. He thinks something happened. They had this experience. We can't really, you know, say for sure, but they had some sort of visionary experience, right? Or maybe it was a ghost or something, you know, and then you have Bart Ehrman, you know, who's one of the most famous New Testament scholars, they, uh, he's done a lot of debates. He thinks visions can account for the resurrection appearances. Well, the disciples saw something, but some sort of visionary uh, encounter, whether it was, you know, what kind of vision, he doesn't really say, but the point is that he thinks there's some sort of vision. Same thing with uh, Gerd Ludemann. You know, he thinks that they had some sort of vision, some sort of uh, visionary experience. Now, we talk about visions, remember, you have to define it. 
um, you can have a vision of something, but generally, you know, if you have a vision, it could be outside yourself, like something external to you, or it could just be a product of your mind. You know, Christians do have visions today. You know, some people claim to have visions of God. Muslims say to have visions of Jesus in the Middle East. And those are more subjective visions where they're, it's something in your mind. It's not something on the outside coming in. It's just an experience inside your mind. So if they mean vision as an objective vision, then that's okay because they're saying that they saw physical Jesus, although maybe in a spiritual sense. But if they get into the subjective vision thing, then that's more like an hallucination where you're just like hallucinating something in your mind. So unfortunately, though, I think we know that most of the appearances in the New Testament look like they're, they're seriously physical appearances. They're things where they can touch Jesus, touch his wounds, eat with them. It really doesn't come across as a ghost in any way or something that's non-physical, just reading the four Gospels, right, alone in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, Paul, when he um, had that experience on the Damascus Road, he said he heard the same boy, or you know, the, the, the people around him heard the same voice. They did not see anyone. Paul seems to be talking about something that happened outside himself, this, these, this external thing that's happening. Now, we don't know what he saw. We don't know if it looked like a physical raised Jesus and a big light. We don't know. He claimed, you know, something knocked him off the road. He was blinded by this brightness. But Jesus spoke to him. He said, Why are you persecuting me? And so that's something that happened to Paul, you know, but it didn't happen to the rest of them there. They didn't, you know, see Jesus or anything, because obviously they weren't, didn't come to faith. And, you know, when Paul talks about this, the way he describes it, he's talking about his eyes seeing something, you know, seeing with the mind, perceiving to know, to become acquainted by experience. So it's not just limited to visionary seeing, it's physical seeing, it's something external to yourself. And, you know, he talks about seeing the, the raised Jesus in 1 Corinthians 9, 1, and, you know, to see means to have physical sight. So it seems to be something that's external to Paul. I mean, it can't be 100% dogmatic, but the point is it seems to be some sort of physical thing as well, just like the other disciples. Um, now, some people are going to say, you know, one of the most common explanations they come up with, with their explanation of the data is that the disciples hallucinated. That's probably the most common Common thing we hear now, um, one of the most common naturalistic, skeptical explanations, um, it has problems because hallucinations are generally in your mind. Um, I had a hallucination when I was about, I think I was like 10 years old. I got a fever, like a 104 fever or something. And my, I was in my room yelling out and I thought I was seeing a monster coming down the hallway to my room. And I screamed and my dad, mom came in and said, no, 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 you're hallucinating, you know. So people hallucinate sometimes, but that's generally an individual thing that happens. It's in your mind. And most people can't participate in your hallucination as well, right? It's not like a group thing where my mom and dad ran in the room and said, oh, can we, can we jump into your hallucination and see what you see? Maybe we can have the same hallucination. No, it doesn't work that way. Um, so to say that they all hallucinate and have a group hallucination would mean they all were kind of sharing each other's hallucination in different modes. But um, and the other thing is in psychology, there isn't a lot of evidence for group hallucinations. There's evidence for individual hallucinations, but not group hallucinations, okay? And remember, there's generally a, a, a few criteria that uh, psychologists look for when you talk about a collective hallucination. Um, generally, you generally look for some sort of expectation. Basically, they're expecting something to happen. Um, that, that would mean the disciples were expecting Jesus to rise from the dead. They're sitting around waiting excited, emotionally excited, you know, Peter talking, oh, I can't wait. He's going to rise any minute. We're going to see him. This is exciting. And they're all just, you know, hyped out. Um, and they basically also, number three, they had some sort of outline of what might happen from their own background or experience, you know, that the Messiah was going to rise. Not a lot in the Old Testament about the Messiah rising from the dead. Not a lot of passages, um, not a lot in their background to believe that. They weren't real excited, as far as we can tell. They were grieving um, over his death, um, and not a lot of expectation because you know what happened. Jesus told them he would rise, die, and rise from the dead, and they didn't believe it. Right? They rejected his his role there as a prophet, and he said, "I will three days I'll rise from the dead. I will suffer and die and rise." And they said, "No, you're not." Um, they had a hard time believing it. They didn't understand it. Not a lot of um, evidence that the, the you know that their experiences meet the uh, criteria for group hallucination. Okay. Um, and it's very hard to psychoanalyze them too. You can't really sit Peter down a couch today and say, what did you see? We just can't do that. You know, we can't really psychoanalyze them. 
Um, you know, you could say, you know, if someone says, well, it's possible they hallucinated, well, like I said, you can throw out all the possibilities you want. Uh, the question is, what's the evidence for such possibilities? And as I said, just because something's possible doesn't mean it's reasonable, okay? So, you know, someone can throw it out there, you can do that. But how well does it explain all the data? Does it explain what happened to Paul? Does it explain the disciples? That means, okay, so if they hallucinated, that means that Jesus is still dead somewhere around there. He's laying around somewhere, I don't know, hidden or something. Do they know where he is? Do they know where his body is? Um, you know, is it just something they're going to start lying about it now and go preach it? Um, you know, they, they could be deceived. I mean, you know, but still the body's somewhere, right? It's got to be somewhere. Do the Roman authorities know where it is? You know, do the Jewish people know where it is? But the point is that if, if, if they hallucinate, I mean, Jesus's body's still somewhere and the tomb was found empty. So you'd have to explain the empty tomb as well. Um, now, someone may say to you sometimes, maybe I'm, they're not persuaded by the evidence. Something you always remember in apologetics, whenever you're talking about uh, reasons for your faith or giving evidence, remember always that evidence and persuasion are two different things. Um, persuasion is more subjective. That means it has to do with your bias, your commitments, your will. The evidence is objective. Everyone can look at the same evidence, but how you're persuaded by it has to do more with your you know, your bias and your confirmation bias, as we say, and your subjectivity. And maybe you just don't like the evidence. Maybe you don't want Jesus to rise from the dead because he calls for commitment on your life. So you just go, eh, you know what I mean? I, I don't like it. I'm not going to deal with it. I'm going to blow it off. Um, two different things. Persuasion and evidence are two different things. So just remember that, okay? Because I run to people all the time. Well, I tried that argument with them. They weren't persuaded. Well, you're not, your job isn't to persuade them. It's the Holy Spirit's job to persuade them, okay? That's the Spirit's role. Your job is to present it and let the Spirit do the rest, okay? If they're not persuaded, that's not your fault. Now, granted, if you present it like you're a jerk or something, you do things to kind of hurt the process, you could do that. But still, you have to remember that don't be frustrated if they're not persuaded, okay? That doesn't, that's not on you to always persuade them. That's the role of the Holy Spirit, using your mouth, using your... Uh, your presentation or what you're talking about, okay? And then just a couple um, other uh, theological discipleship applications. Just remember that <clears throat> when Jesus rose from the dead, he uh, you know, inaugurated the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God broke into the world. And if you look on that side there, the present age, and then you know they were living in a time of sin and reign and oppression like we are today. But Jesus uh, kind of broke into that and start uh, brought a death blow to that right when he rose from the dead but we're in that already not uh not yet yet phase we're there it's here but it's not finished so we live in this tension in this world we live where yeah the kingdom of god is here I'm, i've entered into that reign of god through the messiah and i'm a disciple but this world is so screwed up it's getting more and more frustrating it's getting more and more darker I don't know what to do with the politics. I don't know what to do with all the ethical and moral issues, but I have to be a citizen here. I have to live here and deal with this. That's because you're living in that tension. You're in that middle point right now, that tension point. It's, it's, it's a struggle, okay? We wait for the final return of Messiah to consummate everything, and he will do that in his timing. But the point is that we have to learn how to live in that tension. And for now, until that happens, all we can do is do what he said to do, make disciples, teach others, share our faith, be godly, carry out his calling in our lives. Some of you have been called to do different things. We're all called to make disciples. And the Bible's already called us to do a lot of the same things anyway. And how you do it as a vocation, that's a, between you and God. And maybe he's giving you a choice to pick something. I don't know. But the point is that uh, we live in that tension point right now. So we live as eschatological people. It's not just a future thing. It's here and now. We live as eschatological people in that tension so actually, that was my final uh, devotional piece. So uh, having said that, um, I want to just uh, recall, go back to the beginning, just uh, re reiterate something here uh, about the data issue, if, if you missed that part, because that's really important. Um, remember that we need to get people to, re to think about in inference, okay? Think about inferring things. Stop getting in these arguments or debates with people. Maybe you aren't even. I know some of you on here, Stephen's on here. He talks to Muslims and I've talked to Muslims and we've talked to atheists and all kinds of people. But, 
you know, we get in these debates over, well, you can't prove it, or, you know, you, there's, there's not good enough evidence. Whatever. Just take them to this issue of inference. Talk about how your all judgments in history and science are inferential. Someone's mute is not on. Mute yourself, sorry. Um, and don't let them get away with that. Talk about how, you know, how, as I say here in the middle, you know, we do that in science. We make inferences. We weren't scientists were not there to see how life began. They weren't see to, there to how the universe began. They weren't there to see how so many things in the past happened, but they make an inference on the best explanation that it's not 100% certain. So someone says science is rock certain. You know, science tells us the best thing. Science this, science that. No, scientists take the data and they come up with interpretation of the data and then they make their claim. Okay, they come up with their conclusion, right? And so we need to get people to really thinking about uh, how to make inferences. Very important, okay? Um, so I'm gonna uh, go back to the regular. Um, and I can go back to the slide set. Okay, someone already asked a question here. Charles Half used to preach and teach and preach a Wednesday crucifixion and a Saturday evening resurrection or exact three days and three nights in the tomb like he said in Matthew 12, 1240. I, I really... Um, uh, let's see here. I used to teach, preach on a Wednesday crucifixion, a Saturday evening resurrection, or is an exact three days? Well, I know this. I know I've spoken on the resurrection on a Sunday. I will tell you that much. Um, I haven't, I don't think I've ever preached on a Saturday night on anything really. Um, so I guess I'm going to not be dogmatic about it. Um, if you have to preach on a Sunday and go to Sunday service where they preach on the resurrection, that's okay. Um, and I don't really, most churches, I don't even think, have a Wednesday night service generally. I think it's generally the, you know, they do the, uh, the you talk about the crucifixion. I don't know. Has anyone been, has anyone going to Wednesday night? Did anyone go to Wednesday night service this week? Are they going to one tomorrow? I, I never, I haven't been to a Wednesday night service. Anyone going to one? Anyway, write it in the comments. But no, I, I'm not dogmatic about that. Um, anyway, so let's talk. Anyone, what do you think about that data? Inference claim. Does it make sense? Anyone following it? Do talk. Anybody? Nobody. You guys are just genius. You don't even care about the resurrection. I'm out of here. I'm leaving. Good night. No, I think, I think, End yeah, of no, call. I think it makes perfect sense, Eric. Um, <laughs> I think one of the things that we can really confirm with the resurrection is that our faith isn't it's not something that can't be substantiated, but there, there's intelligence, there's, there's evidence behind it. There's logic behind it. And I think these are some of the things we can, some of the tools we can use to really demonstrate that. Now, I will say to build on what Stephen's saying, he makes an excellent point, is that it's not, I'm just gonna tell you, and Stephen knows this too, because he was on campus, he's still doing it. I mean, you know, other places, but most people, do not know a lot about this. I'd say probably eight out of 10 people have not had a Christian sit down with them and get, tell them, hey, let's go over the data for the resurrection. Let's talk about the best inference, the best explanation. I mean, it takes some time, right? It takes some time. It takes some patience on their part. It takes some patience on your part. Now, I've done it. Don't get me wrong. I've done it on campus because I'm on a campus and others have done it, but it just, you have to understand the average person may not know that much about how to think about this? How do we think about, you know, Jesus rising from the dead? Um, most of people on campus aren't taught on inferential reasoning, right? I mean, I don't think so, as far as I know. Stephen, did you take a class on inferential reasoning anywhere at Ohio State? Um, well, what about the closest you, Noah? thing I took <laughs> was um, Arabic philosophy, where we had to dab a little bit into logic, but not really. Right. But you see how ba it's so basic. I mean, inferential reasoning, you know, we inference also the existence of God a lot of times, just like when you guys look at the design arguments, you know, none of us were there to see the universe fine tuned when it was fine tuned and tweaked or how the DNA information code got going. We make an inference off the, the data, right? And that's we come the best explanation. That's the way science works. Stephen Meyer talks about this all the time. So we use inferential reasoning in everything. Um, uh, it's, I mean, it's one way to approach God in the, the resurrection. I mean, I would say the Holy Spirit real in my life is not an inference. That's direct. That's just like a direct experience. Like I don't, that's not an inference I'm making. Right. 
but that's different. Okay. And so it's important to understand. Oh, I thought I did mute everybody. My apologies. I did hit mute. People can, there, I fixed that. Thank you. Um, yeah. So um, I think we just need to hopefully present it and um, have people go through it if they're interested. You know, it can take some time, but it's worth it. Um, well, let me go back to something on the slide here. I got something I want to bring up. I want to, I want to ask you a question about something now that might as well, how dare you bring it back up? Let me go back to this point. Uh, let's go back here. Let me, da, 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 da. Uh, okay. Oh, by the way, um, that scripture right there, that Paul passage, when I talked about being the, one of the earliest records, I use that with people all the time. Uh, they generally know nothing that that is the earliest record we have. They think it's like something in the Gospels they go to. I always use this one. That's my starting point. They don't know how early that is, that creed that Paul mentions there. It's a very early record, okay? Um, but let's go back to this. Um, now, uh, I would not say that um, many Christians sit around pondering at night. Some Christians, not all Christians, but a lot of Christians are sitting around and bed. How certain am I that Jesus rose from the dead? Is it, how, where am I at on that? The scale, am I doubtful? Am I uncertain? Am I somewhat certain? Am I quite certain? Am I very certain? Um, I don't know. Um, for me, I'm, it, over all the years of studying it, I'm, I'm just about very certain that he rose from the dead. There's, there's a very, for me, I'm not 100% because I wasn't there, but from what I gather with the best inference, the best explanation, I'm very certain Jesus rose from the dead. I and quite certain that he, I think it's it's about almost about 95% probability of 98% almost for me, because I just think it's the best explanation. You know, I'll give it 2% margin because I wasn't there, but that's okay. I don't need it. Um, now, as I said, I have the Holy Spirit's work in my life. I know that Jesus is real. He lives in me. But the point is, if I'm going by history alone, you know, I, I'm I'm very certain. But some of you are going to have to figure that out for yourselves. I don't know. Now, your emotions may push you up and down like you know one day you feel like god's not there in your life he's distant maybe jesus didn't rise maybe it's not real that's your emotions playing with you but if you go by the, what you know with going back to the facts you stick with the historical issue you know i know i have to go back on what i know i know he rose from the dead that's what i say i have knowledge he rose from the dead yeah so anyone else have any thoughts on that or you think you just kind of go up and down or not sure or does anyone want it too scared to talk about it <laughs> Anybody? There are still also people who just um, don't even know that there is the ability to make an inference, that there is the data available there um, to try and make an inference or they don't really think about it. Like I had somebody, this was a, a new Christian too. So it's, you know, they may not have thought about it too much just because of that, but you still hear people say things like, oh, well, you know, I, I, I realize sometimes I have to, to choose between Christianity and, and science, or it's like, wait a minute, th there's not a distinction that you have to, to make there. Um, there. There's evidence um, for Christianity, and it, it doesn't have to be, you know, against science. And I think it's the same way just with the, the resurrection, too, is people still, I think a lot of people, Christians or not, think that our faith, like you mentioned before, is just something that you just have to believe without actually um, knowing that there, there's a basis for that. And I, I think that's really prevalent. Um, and I think it's another reason that um, a lot of people, when they, they face different types of circumstances and all they have is in an evidenceless faith, they can really struggle to, um, to walk with Christ in that way because they, they think, well, is any of this really true? Right. Um, and then, you know, they say somebody comes up to them and, says there isn't really any evidence to this or they read whatever blog says that or right. blog, whatever video and it's like oh well wh why do i do this you know is, is god really with me I'm, I'm not feeling it today right but if they just had that um background of here's the data we can make this inference and that's going to support your faith i think it'd be useful you don't I think to... have, yeah no do you think that the other problem is the way we teach faith it's kind of divorced from knowledge sometimes. Like we don't really know much, right? It's kind of like, yeah, I just have faith, but there's no knowledge undergirding it, right? Sometimes we teach it like that. Yeah, I think a, a lot of churches don't really teach that there is anything other than faith. They say this is real, but they don't say why. Right, 
Right. But, you know, we, as, as Kokel says here, you know, we, we need to teach people, you know, obviously like we're, we're responding to the knowledge God has given us, right? We respond to that. That's what you're doing. Like when I always have a Bible, I have a Bible, right? I'm, I don't have one on me. Sorry. I'm a, I'm a heretic. Um, it's upstairs in my room, but the point is that our, our faith only appropriates what is in the Bible, right? That's what we're doing. Our faith is appropriating what's in this book. Okay. And so we need to, people need to understand that. They think, I think sometimes they think if they just have faith, they have like faith and faith. Like I, you know, I just believe harder. I can, you know, just, you know, it's just sometimes we forget that. Okay. And um, it's very important. So um, yeah, we have to teach them. There's some knowledge on undergirding what we believe this is what god how we know god we have knowledge of god through creation and through history um something that's very basic it seems but maybe we just don't bring this up what do you think Stephen? we teach faith work correctly he's gone he's there but it's he's... important to teach that our faith is Yes, it is sourced in knowledge, and it's not just blind faith, but it's an active faith based off, like what you mentioned, the evidences and the proofs. Right, right. I mean, it's a living relationship with God. Obviously, God is real, and, you know, it's it's a relationship with the Creator through Jesus, but we have reasons to believe that that's a real thing. We have reasons to believe that God's there and that He is the Creator and Jesus rose from the dead. Um and everybody gives reasons for everything else in their lives. Gosh, the, we fight over elections. As many reasons as we give for voting one person or the other, we spend hours doing that. But, you know, then when it comes to this, it's like, oh, there's no reasons for it. We just believe. It's like, okay. Well, it's just interesting. So, uh, you know, that's just unfortunate. We do with so many other things. Um, oh, it's not. Eric, yeah, go ahead, Sam. I, I think sometimes it's, it's different church culture. It's something with different church emphasize certain thing. I remember one of the, the church I used to go to, they have seeker services on right. a weekend, right. you know, like a Saturday, and then and then they use a movie. And I was shocked. They they use the uh, uh, Raiders of, of the Lost Ark. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lip of faith. I'm it's sorry. A, I had to crack at the up. end of it, you just have to make that move. A leap of faith. Say, oh my God. Raiders of the Lost Ark, you mean the part where he's walking across with the foot down and the, the bridge shows up like faith? Yes. Or, oh, that yes. one. Yeah. You have to take the leap of faith, right? Yes. It's okay. Like, oh, see, crack. <laughs> I, I, I should have done that when I was on campus. I should have showed that movie. I'm shame on me. Yeah. Um, I should have used that illustration. But well, uh, I think, yeah, I, I think that was inspiring you. Was church, it? You're saying inspired you a lot. A lot of right? church promote that that approach so they promoted that approach yeah i think the church promoted a lot of church promoted oh my god i've been to a lot of church that's not <laughs> and i talked to a lot of christ a lot of believers genuine <laughs> nice believers. yeah you just have to take that leap of faith already <laughs> yeah well i i understand what they're saying that you, you do have to take a step i mean just like when you get married you, at some point you say, I will, you step out, but you step out based on the knowledge you have of that person, right? Yeah. Like you don't just commit to like, oh, I don't know anything about my wife at all. I don't know a darn thing, but I'm just going to go ahead and step out. You know, I mean, you have some reasons for marrying her, right? So I'm not saying you have to have every reason nailed down, but at least you have something to go off of, I hope for, before you step out and trust God. You know what I mean? Some reason, even the gospel's a reason right? Jesus died. He rose from the dead. That's an historical claim we're making, right? And, uh, you know, that that's based on evidence and good reasons. So, but there has to be something there, some context to go off of, right? So, um, well, because, yeah. because all my friends go to church, that's why I go to church. I want to be a, a join a group of nice, friendly people. Well, <laughs> we all know, People sometimes go to church for sociological reasons. That's one reason they go. Not that that's terrible, but we need other reasons too. Um, but uh, that is a big factor, I know. Um, sometimes, you know, Sean McDowell says that uh, people become Christians for the benefits. You know, what, what am I going to get out of it? And then when the benefits stop, they bail out. You know, so I don't know what who fed them what gospel. But you know what I mean? They look at it as something, some sort of benefit they'll get out of it. Benefit is I get a nice group of people in my life. 
But then one of them lets me down, now I'm bailing out, right? See, so it doesn't, you know, it's, it's very tricky. I mean, you got to make sure we're presenting the right gospel. Yeah, definitely. Um, I personally have not experienced the Raiders of the Lost Ark. What's that? What's that, uh, yeah, Stephen? I had a couple of questions for you regarding the resurrection. Um, so yeah. uh, are you familiar with the, the Jewish rabbi Tovia Singer? Oh, I sure am. Well, one Absolutely. of his objections to the, to the resurrection, um, I don't know if you actually addressed this earlier. I wasn't here at the beginning. But in 1 Corinthians 15, 4, it says, in, according to the scriptures, he was buried and he was raised on the third day. Uh huh. So he objects to this by saying, well, nowhere in the Hebrew Bible does it explicitly say that the yep. Messiah would rise on the third day. I have okay. an answer to this, but I wanted to, I wanted to hear what you would have to say to this objection. Yeah, well, I do have an answer to it because I have a blog post on it. I'm trying to find it. Well, I'll, let me post. Go ahead and you talk, and I'm going to find my blog post as you're talking, Stephen, your answer. Then I'll tell you what I think. Go ahead. Well, there's um, there is a specific location that I do think gives you an actual explicit reference to the three days and uh psalm 16 um in verse 10 it says you will not allow your faithful one to see decay well i looked right. into this and apparently a body doesn't start decaying until after three days after it's been buried um so this is actually referenced by paul in uh acts 13 as well when he's talking to the jews he, he uses psalm 16 to prove the resurrection of christ and um, I don't know. I thought that was a, I could, I think that would be a, a interesting answer, but I would say more so maybe typologically, you could say how Jonah was in the, in the heart of the, of the fish for three days and three nights and how the son of man would be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. That's actually the, the argument that Jesus uses for the Pharisees about the sign that will be given to their generation as the only sign that will be given to them. So, um, I don't know. Those are, that's like kind of my, like my short answer. I don't know if you have a, a better one. But I know, yeah, another, yeah. I know another thing is like if you do like a systematic study of the third day in the Bible, yes. um, it, it always it's always referencing like new life. Like when you look at it every single time, the new uh, third. Oh, sorry, Stephen. Hold on. I muted you by accident, Stephen. Can you unmute yourself, Stephen? I had to mute you because new people came in. Stephen, can you unmute yourself? Or do I have to do it? Where are you? Yeah, no, that's all there I wanted go. to say. There you go. Yeah. You're right. Um, unfortunately, I cannot find my blog post I wrote on that. My point was your point, Stephen, exact same thing. I can't find it. I'll have to send it out later. Um, yeah, you look in the Tanakh, the Old Testament, you see God does very significant things on the third day, like in Hosea 6.2. Hosea 6.2 is one text where he talks about restoring, bringing restoration on the third day. Um, there's other passages where God is always doing something very significant in Israel's history on the third day. And so I think Paul is using that as a background, um, like a motif there, you know, significance on the, you know, Jesus is obviously raised on the third day, but as far as the Old Testament teaching that, yeah, I think he's using that as like a motif there. Um, you know, look up Hosea 6, 2 and some other, I have some other ones. I had it on my blog post. So I can't find them. Look at my blog and it's, buried away somewhere off to post it later when i see you guys email but yeah uh to tobia likes to bring that up michael brown had an answer to it in jewish objections volume three um which i piggybacked on and, and looked up michael's references and kind of built on that um but i definitely think that yeah you can use that third day motif if you look it up in the old testament and show that the third day is just a means a day of something significant god is doing to bring restoration something new right um, I think the Psalm 16 passage you mentioned um, about Peter, uh, or about David, writing about my holy one will not be decay, which is quoted in Acts 2. Or Acts, is it Acts chapter 2? The book of Acts, uh, Peter mentions it in his sermon. I think that's a typology where uh, David, the first, uh, the, the uh, type is David there, like David is the original type, and then it explodes in like the anti-type which is uh jesus you know so i think that's obviously it's got like a dual reference there to david and then because obviously david saw decay you know he had to be writing about someone else as well right someone that's coming that wouldn't see decay and that's jesus so i think i see it more of like a typology of some kind there but it is about jesus yeah i think because that's the way peter quotes in acts right or some will just say it's a direct prophecy it's just a one-on-one -on -one correspondence you know these just peter's david's writing about jesus 
way down the line, he doesn't know it's Jesus, right? David's prophesizing about Jesus, right? But my holy one won't those see decay. So that it could be a direct prophecy as well. Um, typology, what's the question? And you're asking me what that is. I don't know what your question is. You're asking what typology is? In the Okay, quickly, typology is where you look at things in the Old Testament, people or places or patterns, and you see how um, they kind of like have a picture. I'll just give some examples. So you read about the Passover in the Old Testament, the Passover lamb, right? Being sacrificed in Israel's history. In the New Testament, Jesus becomes the Passover lamb. He is literally sacrificed as the Passover lamb. The type is the Passover in the Old Testament. The fulfillment, the anti-type is Jesus or the temple. The temple is a picture of Jesus. The temple is where they took their sacrifices to get forgiveness of sin. They always had to take the sacrifice into the temple and they receive forgiveness. But Jesus is the fulfillment of the temple because he's the temple in person, right? He's the anti-type where he fulfills the temple, right? There's all kinds of that. David was a king, King David. He was a son of God. He's called a son of God in uh, the Old Testament. But Jesus is the actual, the, the, the anti-type. He is the Davidic king, the son of God, not just a son of God. He is the fulfillment of that. He is the son of God, right? And the Davidic king, not just a Davidic king, but the Davidic king. And uh, there's all kinds of examples of that in the Old Testament um, that it gets fulfilled. So it's a type of prophecy. Typology is a type of prophecy, but it's not it's just a more of a picture pattern or something in the Old Testament that gets fulfilled in the New Testament. Hope that helps. I have a post on that too. I could post later. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Tobiah, uh, I had a guy that was stumbled by Tobiah for months. I had to keep sending him resources. So Tobiah gives people problems. I don't find his arguments very convincing, but if you don't know apologetics, he'll just go on and on and on and on. <laughs> you have to respond to him. Now he won't debate Michael Brown anymore either. He got uh, in a debate with Michael Brown in New York. They went to a home and debated Michael, and Michael beat him pretty handily. And one of the, the people that Tobiah converted uh, or came to faith in Jesus, the Jewish person, left Tobiah's camp, became a Messianic Jew. And Tobiah, ever since, will never debate Michael again after that event. So Michael talks about it. You can read it on his website. Yeah, anybody else? Comments or questions? Okay, so typology is an Old Testament prophecy comes true as fulfilled in the New Testament. Yes, that's what it is. It's a type of prophecy. It's not the only kind of Old Testament prophecy, but it is a, it's a, it's it's called a typological prophecy. Okay, so yes. Um, also, one more example is when um, in the Old Testament in Genesis, when um, uh, Abraham is going to sacrifice Isaac, and God uh, tells uh, Abraham that he'll he'll raise him up, or I'm sorry, Hebrew. <laughs> Isaac is a type of sacrifice in a way. I mean, that's kind of what, like, a, or Joseph, Joseph being rejected by his brothers. You know, he's misunderstood and rejected. He's like a type of Jesus where he's rejected. You know what I mean? But he's not Jesus. You know, so there's some pictures or patterns there. There's all kinds of them. Yes. Type of prophecy. Um, yeah. Anybody else? Any comments or questions? Anything? I had another question if no one else wants to offer one. Um, well, I'm waiting for anybody else. Anybody else, else, else want to? Anybody else want to put any? You can put your question in the chat room too, if you don't feel like talking. Okay, we'll go ahead, Stephen. We'll wait for them to type. Go ahead. I, um, so, like, what can you explain the relationship between the Nazarene inscription, um, if you know of it, and the uh, resurrection? No, I can't. I know the Nazarene inscription, but um, off the top of my head, I cannot, I can't explain it thoroughly on the resurrection, what the relationship is. I do, I have a work on archaeology. I know about the Nazarene, but I can't remember. What, what is it? Is it like how it's just related to the resurrection? Well, um, so from what I've read on it, it was a, a Roman edict to, to Jews that would have been right around the time in which the resurrection happened. Um, talking about to, to stop digging up graves for bodies. Oh, that's right. So that's the, the right. argument is, well, why are the Jews digging up all of these grave sites? Well, they were looking, seemingly the theory is they were looking for the, the body of Christ to try and invalidate the Christians that were like spontaneously rising. So it's like a positive proof for the resurrection. 
Yeah, I'll post it here. I found it. I found a biblical archaeology. I'll post the link there. That's what it is. Oh, oh that's not what I want. I went to everyone. What happened there? There we go. There we go. There's the link if you can read about it if you want it. Yeah, it's uh yeah, it's a yeah, the Greek in inscription of a marble tablet. Um the Nazarene inscription is a Greek inscription on a marble tablet that uh, we don't know the exact time uh, when, you know, the place of discovery is not known, but what it says is that, uh, what does it say here? I'm trying to remember. I, I remember reading about that. Yeah, the edict. Um, well, it's a, it's a long, long read. The six features in the Nazarene inscription, which do not fit a non-Jewish Gentile context. There's a ref there's no reference of bodies being dug out of the ground, only if they're being extracted from tombs and graves. Okay. So there's no reference to human ashes being scattered or urns of cremated individuals being stolen or destroyed. Um, yeah, so basically you're talking about how this supports the fact that they wouldn't want to move the body. Like take okay, Jesus. Yeah, yeah, I see now. yeah, yeah, I'm reading it. Yeah. There's other there's another argument that um they would have made um tomb veneration, you know, that they would have, you know, most tombs were venerated. So if they hadn't known where the they, they you know they know where the tomb was, you know, the the, the there's something about no, I'm not I'm talking about tomb veneration. I'm talking about some law, there's some laws in place about stealing bodies yeah well yeah that's what you're talking that's what it is it's all tied to the Nazarene inscription it's all coming back to me now yeah so they wouldn't have moved the body they wouldn't have wanted to move the body right um is that what you're trying to say or what i'm understanding yeah i mean i didn't i didn't actually read it before but um i i just heard this used once in a presentation talking about how it in some way provide positive reinforcement for the resurrection yeah, so um, there's also, yeah, there's also a part two of that article. I just clicked on it. Um, oh, this even gets even deeper. So I'll post that as well. This is from the, I know who's who's on that biblical archaeology site. That's Brian, uh, I can't remember his last, Ted. Ted uh, Brian Wood? Yeah, Brian Wood. I think that's Brian Wood. I think he's on there. Yeah, I posted the second link. Ooh, that's a long link. Sorry, but you can click on that. Um, yeah. Um, does anybody have a, a thought on what your tough up objection to the resurrection is? Anybody? Anybody encountered a really tough objection? Some of you are just awfully quiet. Should be out sharing the resurrection 24 hours a day. What's wrong with you? Don't you just share it everywhere you go? So I'm just kidding. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I don't share it everywhere I go either. But go ahead. Anybody have any thoughts? Um, I have been told. Yes, thank you. Um, I've been told by friends who um, are Muslim, that they are taught and believe that um, Jesus did not die on the cross. That's right. That the instant before Jesus died, God supposedly switched him out with Judas Iscariot's body or something like that. Yep, that's right. That's what they're told and it's incorrect. Um, Stephen, you want to comment right. on, do you want a question like what's the, the issue with that or? Yeah, sure. I can uh, maybe quickly comment. So in the Quran, there's this verse, it's Surah 4, chapter 4 of the Quran, verse 157, which says that, uh, it reportedly says that the Jews say, we've killed uh, Isa, or Jesus, son of Mary, the Messiah, the messenger of Allah, but they did not kill him, but it was made to appear like they killed him. He was not crucified. Um, so there is a later interpretation that supposedly happened with this fanciful story of Jesus and his 17 disciples, not 12, at least in the Islamic narrative. And one of the disciples, Allah, magically transformed to be like Jesus. And then as the Jews were coming to arrest Jesus, they actually arrest the, the lookalike. And then Allah zips Jesus up to paradise to be of him. And so instead of Jesus being crucified, it's actually the imposter that's crucified and so jesus wasn't actually crucified but was made to appear like he did and that's been the common very much streamlined muslim interpretation although some scholars do think that there is an interpretation within the quran that can allow for the crucifixion of jesus it's a little more 
nuance, but yeah, that's typically the standard Muslim approach. Yeah, but hold on a minute. Let me add something there. Um, I, yeah, Stephen's right. Absolutely. I just want to share one thing. I have a slide I just wanted to share um, to build on what he's saying. So uh, Stephen already knows this too. I'm not saying he didn't doesn't know this. I just want to mention something. Okay, so the New Testament writing, darn it. Sorry, the New Testament writings are all within the first century, right, Adria? When we know about right. Jesus' death. So look at the right. end point there, the temple being destroyed in 70 AD. The Quran is written in the 600s, six centuries mm -hmm. after the time of Jesus by a guy that had no contact with the first century disciples, didn't know Jesus, didn't know any of the eyewitnesses. And so when Stephen and I, and especially me, as Stephen knows, I've gotten frustrated about this, when I point this out to Muslims that it's six centuries later, and how am I supposed to trust a guy that was in the sixth century who tells me Jesus didn't die when he had no contact with the first century? Um, I'll take the first century evidence over the sixth century evidence in the Quran. Yes. They don't care, though. They don't care. Um, I had a girl tell us three weeks ago at a high day. I presented this to her and I said, don't you think it's more rational to believe the New Testament, what it says about Jesus and his death? She said, no, no, the Quran's more rational. I mean, that's what you wow. deal with, with them. They, they don't think, it's just, they don't think rationally about it. Right, Stephen? Generally? Well, for <laughs> them, um, that's exactly right. So their understanding of the Quran being divine revelation will supersede any and every other historical claim because the Quran is the literal dictated word of Allah. Right. So it doesn't matter, you know, just by itself, the so Quran has to be believe, believed. As far as it being the literal dictated word of God, they, they, in that, that's what the Bible is, right? Uh, it's not, it's that. not actually the exact same. We believe that the Bible is the inspired and errant word of God, yes. But what Muslims believe is that the Quran is literally um, an internal entity alongside a law. And that the dictation view is that there's supposedly no human element within the, in, within the inspiration of the Quran. Um, Muhammad re receives the text. He's not the one who's composing the text, like the biblical authors, like Moses wrote the Torah. There, there's a human element, but it's being superintended through the Holy Spirit, right? But with the Quran, so, okay. this sort of idea does not exist. It's, it is, so, it's the eternal. Are they saying the, that the Quran is was sort of? Um, uh, right now, I can't think of his name. Who uh, he was like the recording secretary and just wrote down what God said in Islam. Well, yeah, you could think of it that way. Like Muhammad is essentially just the mailman. Like he is. Wow. Yeah, he he's just the one who is revealing the text. In fact, he himself, according to their narr like classical narratives, he actually never wrote the Quran down. His later Muslims, after his mm -hmm. death, wrote it and compiled it and everything. Um, now, I think a very, to, to rebut their argument, there's a few things you can, you can look at. The simplest argument is to use what, I, what many apologists and scholars call the Islamic dilemma. The Quran affirms the authenticity and the inspiration and preservation and authority of the Bible. So if the Bible says that Jesus was crucified, that means the Quran is wrong because the Quran affirms the Bible. And so there's like this internal contradiction and dilemma within the most authoritative source of Islam itself, the Quran, right? The second mm -hmm. thing you can do is, well, you could challenge them historically on this. Um, like Eric noted, um, our earliest documents of the reports of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus come from the first century and the Gospels and the letters of Paul and the rest of the New Testament. And you should use the, essentially the, the historical reasoning for establishing the authenticity is using the earliest sources. That's one of the, and then multiple attestation. You also have the non-Christian sources that Eric also mentioned. Um, and then thirdly, I would argue that it's possible you have to you have to do your homework on this, but it's possible to make this argument. Well, the Quran actually does say Jesus was crucified, 
Now that's not the that's not the stream like the streamline interpretation, but it, it's possible to interpret the Quran in such a way. Uh, if you want a good scholarly article on this, Dr. Gabriel Said Reynolds, he's a professor in Notre Dame. He has an article that is uh, Jesus dead or alive in the Quran, and he talks about essentially it's a it's a scholarly excursus of the Quran and giving an argument for the Quran. I'm talking about Jesus actually dying. So um, th that's the three ways I would approach it. I, I, uh, Stephen, I posted the link by David Wood on the Islamic Dilemma. So that's in the chat room. I posted that. That's your best bet, Adria. See that link there? Yeah. I posted yeah. it in chat. Yeah, look up. Use that link, the Islam Islamic Dilemma. Study that. But um, I my also experience... Have a, yeah, I have a ahead, video Steve. of it, too, that I made. Well, someone recorded me doing it. But if you want that, I can send it to you my stuff on this as well. Please. Yeah, Stephen did a whole presentation on the Quran for us at Ohio State and all the Muslims showed up to argue with him. So that was yeah, fun. I'm sure. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't around then. I was teaching somewhere else and it was, I heard the fireworks wow. were going off. Um, wow. My experience with Muslims is not that they're very big on facts and reasons. They just are so entrenched in their, uh, their faith, sociologically, pressures, culture, culturally, very hard you know, to talk to them sometimes. Um, Stephen knows better than I do because that's his specialty. Um, what was the name of the professor again, Stephen? Can you type it in the chat room? Someone's asking in the chat room. Can you type it in there? Uh, yeah, Gabriel Said Reynolds. I'll, I'll go ahead and get that. Uh, I'll try and get the link for his article. Gabriel Said Reynolds. That's an interesting name. Said. Said, sorry. I was going to say, Gabriel Said Reynolds. I was like, why did Gabriel say Reynolds? So anyway. Um, <laughs> not, I wouldn't want to say that. I look really dumb. Um, yeah, I, I can't. Their their belief that Jesus never died. I just I'll never. You know, uh, one thing uh, I want to say when I see Adria is that we don't believe the Bible is dictated. Like it was God dictated to to the New Testament authors. It's not like dictation, like a secretary thing, where they're kind of like their minds emptied out. And they're just like kind of like going through a typewriter. We believe God. You know, He inspired it. He uses their personalities, their backgrounds, and everything. Now, how that works, the, the relation between the Holy Spirit working with the human, I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us how. You know what I mean? It doesn't, it doesn't say exactly. When Paul says all scripture is inspired by God, it's God breathed. I, I don't know what that looks like. You know what I mean? But the point is that he inspired them to do it. I, but it's not the same thing the Muslims believe about the Quran. They believe it was dictated word by word. Boom, boom, boom. Wow. Okay. That's not quite what we believe about the Bible. So, which is fine with me, because I don't think uh -huh. you could I don't think there is. I just don't, it makes sense to me, but anyway. Yeah, um, anybody else have any comments or questions? Maybe a couple more, we'll wrap it up, anybody? Some of you are just so quiet tonight. Hi, Eric, this is oh, Janice. Oh, Janice, hey. there you go. Hey, where'd you come hey. from? Hey, how hey. you doing, go ahead. I've been hiding. So That's I all right. just wanted to ask, the person that asked the question about the Wednesday versus, I think they said Sunday, were uh -huh. they making reference to the, there's usually an argument about the um, account in John's gospel versus the gospels of on what day Yeshua actually celebrated yes. the Seder meal. Was, were they referring to that or something else? I don't know if they said about, if, there's, if they're talking about any um, contradiction, I think it's an issue of day. Um, there's always been a debate, maybe, uh, Hold on, I'm going to post something here on this because I, I, I once had to research this. What day did Jesus die? Yes, on Karm. Um, I think they're more about concerned about the day. Um, the that's, day. that's okay. the big issue, the day. Um, yeah. Jesus died. Okay. Yeah, that's that's what they seem to be debating about. I, from what I understand, um, it has to do with that three days, three nights thing. Uh, let's see here. What? Where was that? Um, yeah, I know. Um, FFOZ had a great article because they talked about how uh, it looks like Yeshua may have celebrated the Cedar Mill the day before the actual yeah. Passover, which would make the dates a little different. I was just wondering what that question actually was. Well, the Bible, to. the Bible doesn't really explicitly state which day he was crucified. They're generally the views are Friday and Wednesday. Um, right. Some some use like a synthesis of both the days, and sometimes argue Thursday is the day. That's one other view there. But then, 
Jesus uses that Matthew 12 argument about Jonah and the whale about the three day thing and uses a third day like as an, you know, an illustration there will be raised after three days. And so I think it's that the Wednesday opinion, um, they believe that there's like, like two Sabbaths that week after the first one that occurred on like the evening of the crucifixion. And then the, uh, the Wednesday view holds that the Sabbath was the Passover. And that's where the, the holy days were not necessarily the seventh day that we could refer to as a Sabbath. And so the Wednesday view explains, they think explains, does not uh, violate the biblical account of the women and the spices. It holds to like a very literal view of, of Matthew 12 about the Jonah passage. Um, and then the Thursday view tries to make the synthesis of them. Um, the only problem with the Wednesday view, I guess, is that the disciples who walked with Jesus on the road to Emmaus did so on the same day of his resurrection you know, Luke 24, they didn't recognize him. Right. Um, and so, you know, they say today's the third day that these things happen. So Wednesday and Sunday is four days. And so, um, <laughs> you know, I don't really know, um, you know, what the exact day is. Um, is it really that critical to know the day of the week Jesus was crucified? I don't. Not I don't really. really know. It's not something I think about a whole lot. Um, not really. Yeah, not a real right. game changer for me. Um, I don't really know if there's right, a perfect answer. Right. There's po there's possibilities on way to reconcile it. There's a few possibilities, maybe Wednesday or Friday, or maybe a synthesis on Thursday. But um, okay. I, all I know is that I don't recall. Have you ever had a? I've never been to. I've never seen a resurrection celebrate on Saturday night. I know that on a service. No. You know what I mean? It's always right. Sunday. Now, as far as the. Well, anyway, that's all we're talking. I don't get into that. That'd be a rabbit trail. Never mind. Um, yeah. Thanks. So yeah, you're right. But I, I, I could, you know, find some more research on it if you want. But um, okay. Someone says, or Adria says, she says, I was told the days are one Friday when Jesus was crucified, two Saturday, and three Sunday. Well, that's the most common view. <laughs> I think most of us. <laughs> that's the most traditional view. I think most of us have right. Jesus right. crucified Friday buried it's been buried you know before sundown and uh then raised on the third day so you yeah know, what a time of the day sunday i don't know but i actually guess he was it was sometime in the light i mean they saw this is i found a really interesting chart here it says day of the week the fifth day day of nissan 14 on the gregorian calendar was a wednesday night yeshua's early cedar mill and he was right. arrested then right. on Thursday, uh, there was the Passover lambs were killed, Yeshua crucified and buried. That's a half day. And then it says on the 15th of Nisan, which is the Thursday night, the first day of Kog, Kog, the Kog HaMezot, high Sabbath of the Passover, Friday was the high Sabbath, and that's another half day, and the stone was removed. And then the Friday night, the Rev Shabbat, was the weekly sabbath that was another half day that's what i just said yeah. yeah i talked about more than one sabbath going on here that's what right I that's what they're saying and then on saturday it says the weekly sabbath continues waving the old mayor first fruits that's another half day and then on saturday night have dollar ceremony yeshua's resurrection which is a half day and then on sunday was when the women came to the tomb okay well so you get in these half day issues see that's part of the problem See how we're right. really adding here the half day, right? Right. <laughs> so that's the key to the whole thing. That could be true. That could be accurate. I'm not saying I'm opposed to that view. Um, I don't know. I it make that kind of makes sense. Yeah. You know what I mean? So if you right. consider the Passover right. meal, the Passover meal had to be somewhere there, like Wednesday or Thursday. You know, something had to be tied in there. You know, so yeah, it has right. to start back before that because he had that last Passover meal. Yeah. yeah, I don't really know. I mean, I hadn't really thought about that much recently, so I'd have to look into it more, but it doesn't come up a whole heck of a lot, um, most people, but, you know, it's one of those things about we're nitpicking on, you know, but I think that kind of makes sense, what you're saying, Janice, off the top of my head, think about the half days. Yeah, anyway, good point. Um, yeah, anybody else? Comments, questions? Nothing about the resurrection. Okay, interesting. Uh, who here has ever thought about looking at the resurrection that way? Data, inference, and claim. Come on. Thinking about that all the time. Anybody? Nobody. Okay. Well, 
Yeah, someone say something. Right when I say no one's going to say, someone says something. Yes? Looked at it how? What do you mean? Well, I mean, does anybody, uh, do you have to, have you ever had to do that to anybody where you've had to give the the data, the data is the, the, you know, the stuff we went over the data tonight for the death, the death burial and appearances. And then have you ever had to explain to someone what we, you know, the best explanation thing for that? And then the claim you're making, have you ever had to break it down, like give an historical some sort of historical evidential reason why Jesus rose today, other than, I'm not saying you did this, but I'm saying other than just maybe someone, well, the Bible says so. I mean, that doesn't, yeah, that's okay, but I mean, you may have to break that down a little more. There's a lot more to it. Yeah. Anybody had to do that ever? Nobody. Okay, that's all right. Well, Eric, perhaps I think it'll happen. That, <laughs> Eric, ahead, yes. yeah. I was going to say, I think that it's, that it's unfortunate that I think most of us have just accepted it as kind of like a spiritual experience and never have thought about having to present the, the data. Yes. But I think in the, yes. the culture that we're living in now, like you said, we're going to have to be able to do that. Uh, you, you have to, you bet. there's no way around it. I can tell you from, well, I hate to say this, you know, sometimes I come across like I know everything. It's only because I'm, I'm always reflecting on what I'm seeing in the culture from campus and University kind of is the uh, the gateway to the rest of the culture because people come out of the university and that's how they form their worldviews and they become our leaders, our businessmen, our politicians, our whatever. And so, you know, sadly, I kind of see what the trends there. Now, if you ask me, the family is the first educator of everybody. So hopefully the family, we're educating our kids and our youth on these issues, right? Um, it's not the responsibility of your youth pastor. It's nice if he does it, by the way, or your pastor, by the way, but it's the first responsibility really to parents to try to equip our kids to know some of this stuff because they're going to hear this stuff, you know, and they need to know how to articulate the resurrection. But our culture is becoming post-truth, more post-truth, more post-Christian, more post-this. Um, there's a new book out called Apatheism. I'm going to try to get that speaker on for a Zoom call. Just means people are just apathetic about God. Doesn't mean they don't believe it. It just means they're not really seeing the need. See, they're not thinking about truth. They're thinking about, well, what's the relevance? That's why if you looked at my PowerPoint tonight, I said back here at the beginning, what I say, I said at the very beginning of the presentation, I'm getting my slides set on here. I said at the very beginning, um, you know, people like to say it's not relevant to me. Well, if it's true, it ha if it happened, it happened. Whether you believe it, it doesn't change anything. It doesn't matter how busy you are or whether you see the relevance for it. I mean, you might not see the relevance for it. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. Um, and if it's true, it has great relevance, right? I hope so. I mean, if you don't think it's true, you don't think it's true. Let's talk about why you don't think it's true, why you don't care. I mean, if it's true, it impacts everything, right? So um, that's why when I do... Uh, an outreach question we have at Ohio State now, one of our favorite outreach questions is, I have on, on a board, on a whiteboard, the question is, does eternal life matter? Yes, no, or I don't know. Does eternal life matter? See, I get that. I don't assume they think it matters. I'm asking them, does it matter? Because I'm getting to see, to talk to me about what is eternal life, and I'm trying to explain why it does matter. See, we can't assume people think it's important or it matters, right, right away. Anyway, so Janice, you're correct. You have to, you're going to have to have some other things in your tool belt today. No doubt about it. Absolutely. I have a question for you. Yeah. Oh, Travis. Yeah. Good to see you. Yeah. Go yeah. Ahead. Um, when I'm on campus, one of the biggest problems I have is just getting some students um, to even countenance the idea of a miracle taking place with the resurrection. Yeah. Um, I get a lot of the whole Dillahunty thing where until you prove this is a possible thing scientifically, then we can't even accept the miraculous as a possible explanation kind of thing. Yeah. Is that the yeah. Sort of, do, you, do you get that kind of response? And do you, um, what sort of, I mean, I, I can take him through the long winded response to David Hume, but right. how do you normally respond to that? Um, well, first of all, I mean, you mentioned the science issue. I mean, you know, I know we had Tim McGrew on and I know you, you were here. Um, and I know you know this, Travis, but if they bring up science, well, science studies the natural world. That's what it's restricted to, right? It's methodological naturalism. You know that. So 
if someone tries to use science, then w w why are you going to bring that up when the whole game, the, the rules have been rigged already and the game is science not to look for miracles? That doesn't mean miracles don't happen. The question is whether we have the tools to study them in science, right? And so that's what I first say to you about science. Um, that, that's just a silly objection to set up the rules ahead of time and say, well, science can't find, you know, unless science can prove it. Well, that's silly because science only studies natural causation. Um, but as far as them having a hard time with a miracle, um, I try to bring it back to the point, like there's one guy years ago, he said, well, I haven't, he was ye yelling at all of us. He said, well, I haven't seen a man rise from the dead recently. Have you seen anyone rise from the dead? Well, that's the whole point. It's not a common thing. It's a rare thing. And it happens for a very specific reason. Like Tim McGrew said, God is trying to get our attention. And so I, um, I try to point it back to them as saying, are you open to the fact that God can speak through history, that he can use history to speak to you, right? Um, that he can use an historical event. If you're not open to God being able to do that, why not? Why can't he speak through a man and speak through resurrection? If God exists, the greatest miracles already occurred. He created the world and natural causation can't explain that. So why can't he raise a man from the dead? So I maybe put it back on the creation issue, uh, Travis, and you talk about what they believe about creation. And if then we can yeah. get them, get them to think about that at that. Now, if they already believe in creation, they don't believe in the resurrection. That makes no sense. But yeah. I'm saying to you, if they're a deist, you know, then you can take them from their deism makes no sense because they believe deism already halfway home. But take them back maybe to creation, see what they believe about how we got here, you know, stuff like maybe kind of back work back to the resurrection. Have you tried that? <laughs> Yeah, you know, yeah, I have tried that now that you mention it, and this actually has worked pretty well. Um, I actually tried that. I was, I'm sure you know, uh, Matt, um, Matt Schmidt. Yeah, you know Matt Schmidt. Yeah, yeah, I've he seen him a long time. Yeah, yeah, he came up here and we we did a lot of evangelism for a while, and he showed me that and it actually worked really well in the conversation. So, well, you know, like Frank Turk, when you know he's a very effective presenter, the reason Frank's so effective, his arguments are not that. He's a general apologist. He takes uh, complicated uh, material. He takes stuff like William and Craig's and other more heady academics. He makes it digestible for people so they can follow yeah. it. And the one thing he says is that, you know, if, if you accept the greatest miracle is creation. If you accept that, that God created the universe, that it didn't happen just through natural causation, then you should be able to think about the resurrection then after that. Now, yeah, like I said, but generally travis you know and i know that it's not always intellectual why they're rejecting the miracle issue they're rejecting it because of a moral issue and they know that if jesus rose from the dead he makes claims on their life and they don't yeah. like it so sometimes i bring that up i say you know have you ever considered maybe if he rose from the dead that that's a claim on your life and that's a very scary thing you know i've been there i try to empathize with them maybe bring that up a little bit but um you're right the david hume thing refuting hume's arguments which everyone's kind of repeating those takes some time and whether they're open to that. Um, but yeah, I'd maybe go back to the creation issue and try that. Yeah. See if you know, they're yeah. open to look at that. Um, but you know, miracles are rare events. They're not supposed to happen all the time. You know, they're not, never are. And so we need to emphasize that they're, they're supposed to get people's attention in certain time periods. Yeah. Um, yeah. And ask, more... asking, asking that question of, uh, if God existed, how would he inter reveal himself? It would have to be through something miraculous. Well, so, yeah. it's just that it's like my, you know, I said in the PowerPoint tonight, as I uh, said here at the beginning, I said that um, if you go back here at the beginning, that ugh, this thing, I just, this slide, I just have to always have to do this before I do this. So if you go to here, you know, if someone doesn't believe in this, you know, if you don't believe that God, I mean, you communicate to people every day, you pick email, phone, whatever. We don't form any relationship through, without communication. So you need to ask the person, how should God communicate to humans? What's he need to do? What, what, yeah. what method should he pick? Well, I don't like history. I don't like that method. He should just appear to me directly. That is no guarantee. First of all, you don't even know what God you're talking about because you don't know what you mean by God. And secondly, what medium should he pick? You know what I mean? If he appears you directly, it doesn't mean you're going to believe it. You could just think you're hallucinating. You may yeah. tell, you may give God the middle finger. So, you know, we need to get them to think about God has to do something to communicate to us. What's he going to do? He picks things he makes and we look at things he makes and we go, hey, there must be a God behind that thing that I see. 
because I can observe it with my five senses. It seems to be a designer behind that. And he picks history through the person of Jesus. So if they're not open yeah. to that, then did he make them tell you what he should do? That's what I do now instead of yeah. coming up with an argument. So that's what I've yeah. been doing a little more of the last couple of years and make them think through. You know, it's always good to ask questions like, you know, Greg Kokel talks about. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. So that's what I try to do now. Um, even when they say, I don't know if God exists, I don't, I can't know. I say, well, what should he do to give you knowledge of himself? What's he going to do? You know, make, make them answer. They generally don't even know. <laughs> Maybe I was going to ask you, Eric, if they go in circles. I was wondering if it, they go into kind of circular reasoning. It's not circular reasoning. It's just, it, I don't know if they're going in circles. It's just an issue of whether they've really thought through yeah, how, I mean, a, how a God communicates to humans. I mean, what should he do? I mean, we communicate to people all the time. We pick mediums. Why can't God pick a medium? He's the God yeah. and we're the, hu the, the finite humans. He's got to, we wouldn't know what God's like unless he communicates. We wouldn't know what to do unless God communicates. You don't know what to do in your job unless your boss communicates to you. You don't know what your boyfriend expects unless he communicates or your wife or your husband or your child. Yeah. This goes on. I do so, think so some of the, if yeah. I, uh, if what Adrian might have been uh, m mentioning, there is some circular reasoning going on in the objection to miracles where, oh, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. science hasn't yeah. found them yet. It's sort of like yeah. the, the story of the drunk guy looking for his keys under the lamplight. He's like, well, I can't find them here. Therefore, they must not be here. And he's only looking there because that's where the light is shining. When yeah. The keys are outside of that lamplight in the same way science would not find miracles. So if you're restricting evidence for you know for miracles to evidence from the scientific method you're just never gonna <laughs> you're never gonna yeah find it yeah. that way we talked about that with tim mcgrew you know a few weeks so you can go back and watch the clip we'll talk about it next week with michael keys he's a historian of science um and we're gonna talk i'll talk about that with him a little bit but yeah this thing of you know trying to use a method that doesn't even allow miracles into the 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 you know the game plan it just and then say, hey, see, look, and you science shows, well, it, it's not rigged to do that the way you're rigging the rules. So, um, yeah, it's just ridiculous. It is, it does turn into circular reasoning a lot of times, um, oh, sadly. Eric, yeah, go ahead, Sam. I, I got a way to, uh, this is the way I usually argue for the resurrection. It's a slightly different route. But I, but I usually said, looking at the disciples, when Jesus was on a cross, everybody's disappear they don't seem like they are heroes or, or, or you know they're brave personality what give them the courage 